welcome everyone. My name is Derek. I'm with the Freewave Marketing Team. Excited for another edition of Freewave's Tech Talk series. Today, we're doing water and wastewater. I'm really excited to have who we have on today. My name is Eric Hansen. Look at that. Am I up? Category Director for Automation and Distribution Products at Border States Electric, and we're headquartered out of Fargo, North Dakota. My name is Reagan. I am a Sales Manager for Cap Logistics. I do not have a lamp in front of me. Do I need one? We're a customized transportation solution provider and focused on uptime. David Northrup, I am a business development manager. All right, cool. I'm just going to go on mute for EN Automation, and I am in Denver, Colorado. My name is Greg Corey, and I'm the director of customer and technical support for Freewave Technologies. Is that better? And we manufacture wireless and data transceivers. Appreciate you guys taking the time and thanks everyone out there for watching as well. Um, let's go ahead and get started. We have a lot of things to talk about. There's a lot of different um, challenges, opportunities out there. I'm curious what you think you know, the kind of impact automation has on the environment. Is it a positive one, negative? What are your, would love to get your thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, certainly. And, and, and I think it's, uh, it's pretty strongly positive. You know, variable frequency drives have been around for, for quite a while. And I, I think everybody has, uh, you know, realized the benefits of, of running a pump um, at, at whatever speed is needed. Um, and and that, that's an easy example. Now with, you know, switching over from, from serial that's been in the field forever to, to more of an Ethernet based um, applications, you know, another thing that we look at is security. It, it enhances security and environmental impacts because you, you really can translate so much more data so much faster and, and, and you, you regulate downtime and, and increase efficiency of all of, the, uh, all of the equipment that's already online. With COVID, right, and the current pandemic, um, what kind of impacts or have there been impacts that that has made on how automation is viewed or needed um, with regards to water and wastewater? Well, I, I think it has, you know, and, and I think it's actually accentuated some of the things that have already been there. You know, there, there's a constant drive to do more with less. Everybody's experienced that it, it, it's, it's universal. And, you know, water, wastewater is certainly critical infrastructure. It has to be up. And, and you know, automation drives additional things that can be done with fewer people. And, and if we can get away from having people congregate um, in, in areas for certain pandemic type situations, I, I think that makes, that makes the, the arena better and, and it makes it more survivable with fewer and fewer people. I just wanted to jump in here for a second and say something in regards to uh, Eric's response about the impact to the environment by automation. I personally think that automation is overwhelmingly positive for the environment. I mean, the smarter we can be about the processes that we're controlling and monitoring, you know, we only need to use the specific amount of energy and no more. And also automation brings automated compliance. So if there are specific rules and regulations we have to follow, automation makes that a lot easier. We can watch these data points, we can generate a report, we can send it to the regulatory body. Um, we can actually empower um, environmental solutions uh, through automation. Like you said, Greg, it, it makes it very easy to, to generate reports and, and all that kind of thing. The, it, it, you know, files download whenever a regulatory body needs to see them. It's an automatic download. It gets sent automatically to the person that needs to review it. And it really cuts down on, on the manpower at all levels where things need to be reviewed. I think that's a great point. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, that automation has other benefits uh, for the environment as well. And to, in addition to the things you mentioned there. You know, maintenance has been based off of interval for such a long time. You know, mean time between failure, that kind of thing. Yeah. And when you get when you get automated systems looking at hard data, you know you can see bearings start to go out uh, based on vibration and, and that kind of thing, and so you know you can get away from replacing a part essentially prematurely. So you know that I right. think that kind of that kind of ties into to manpower number one, but 
you know, environmentally and environmental efficiency as well, because you're not trashing a part before it's totally used up. You're getting its entire lifespan um, right. of availability for use. Yeah, and yep. in addition to that, Eric, being able to, to monitor that um, for the infant mortality of, of those, those bearings, the ones that not only, as you're saying, as they go through their life cycle and we're interested in replacing them right in time before they fail, but also those ones that come off the floor that are defective and last a very short period of time and then sure. fail. And how do we find those to make sure that we're, we're keeping customers up and running as much as possible? Regan, um, water is a basic human right, right? So how does that fact play into this industry's uptime strategy coming from your perspective? Yeah, uh, I think it's, it's really interesting. I mean, water, you know, as you just said, it's, it's a basic human right. So, I mean, it's up there with switching the light on and we have a number of customers in, in the uh, power generation space as well as, as water and wastewater, but you just expect it to be there. And so I think that, you know, for a lot of folks, especially they're in their home, they expect that water's going to work, that the toilet's going to work, things along those lines. But, you know, oftentimes as far as uptime goes for, for our customer base, it's, you know, how do we ensure that those, those customers that we have, that there is no lapse in service on the wastewater side, we've had customers in, in such a bind that they're actually up against, you know, an attrition plan of we're going to start taking truckloads of waste uh, to the dump until we, if we don't get this pump or this motor in, in time and what kind of problems that's going to create and what, what the city's going to have to hear uh, about if they, if they do end up there. Water service has, has been around forever, right? Date back thousands of years. Um, We've touched a little bit on this with automation, right? But what other types of recent techno technological advances have you seen that are playing huge roles? Um, we're partnering with a customer right now, and I'm not sure if I can use their name uh, quite yet, uh, but they are um, pioneering a, a new technology for uh, new sewer lines, which involves robots and uh, using blue light to seal uh, sewer lines. And so the, the products made in Germany and the uh, sealant for the sewer lines looks like basically an inside out sock. And so they take this inside out sock and they have a robot run through the sewer line and pull it right ways out. And then they have another robot come through and use the same technology that probably everyone's had a filling at the dentist where they had the little blue light come in and they press it down on your tooth and it seals your tooth. So how do we use that technology to be able to seal sewer lines at a rate much faster than doing it manually well, if we can get a robot to be able to run through this sealant once the sock comes right ways out and seal those, seal those sewer lines instead of doing it manually to use a robot, uh, the, the production increases they can see are just exponential compared to having folks do those manually. So we're partnering with them. We're bringing in uh, uh, robots from the size of a toy car to the size of a desk to be able to seal pipes and mains from all different various sizes and um, really excited to partner with them in this, this new technology. Within the same realm, what technological trends are you seeing to be, to be most prevalent um, in this industry today? Yeah, I think it, it revolves all around how, how water municipalities or, or in industrial water applications as well, but it, it involves how they use data. Uh, so the biggest trends I've seen are remote monitoring and, and control how do, we, how do we figure out ways to not only see what's going on at these remote facilities, but use that data to, to, to control things? Uh, we're seeing cloud-based SCADA systems be deployed where even five years ago, that was a, a very scary thought for a lot of water uh, municipalities. Um, and then uh, predictive maintenance, it was mentioned earlier, but uh, we are really seeing this as a way to optimize that OEE number. We hear OEE all the time in manufacturing, but it's being used in water with their equipment as well. So um, just finding ways to be smarter about deploying resources to go do maintenance on equipment. And if I could jump in here too, I think, I think that's a really interesting you know, point. And another techno technology piece is, is software you know, going and, and, and the backbone that it's created off of. Um, you know, th there's so many things that, it, that, are, that still run off of, of a serial interface, right? And, and, and the industry has largely gone towards uh, Ethernet IP. 
um, for, for a standard protocol. And, you know, one of the things that we deal with a lot when we're dealing with customers is you have to make it scalable and you have to make it incremental because, you know, you can't, it's not realistic to rip and replace an entire system. It just can't be done. Um, I suppose it could be if you had infinite time and infinite money, but who has that, right? Um, so, so making things scalable and, and getting, getting a lot of places to an updated um, security protocol is, is really very important in the, in the day and time that we live in, especially, David, you know, going back to your cloud-based stuff and remote monitoring, security becomes a huge deal. What are some of the biggest challenges you're seeing for the water industry? Yeah, I'd say at the top of the list, it's already been mentioned, but I'll say it again, is do more with less. Uh, I've heard this term, no the no collar uh, economy, where it doesn't really matter if you're blue collar, or white collar, it, it, everyone's working from home now. We gotta figure out ways to do things remote. Um, and water just traditionally has an aging workforce. There aren't tons of young engineers that are like, yeah, get me into the water industry now. <laughs> um, but we, I am see, I'm seeing more and more uh, at least um, engineers that are open-minded to new ideas, right? Um, but that being said, some of the, one of the biggest challenges is just to put together a strategy to have a digital strategy at all within a water municipality. It's very hard for these uh, engineers to put together that type of a strategy. Second is uh, cybersecurity expertise on staff is a challenge for a lot of these um, municipalities as well. And, uh, and then finally, just in general, integrating data from many different systems uh, and how do you get everything to talk to each other correctly and, and visualize that data is, is a challenge. Yeah, great. Thanks, David. And hey, maybe if we keep doing more of these tech talks where we're highlighting some of the cool things people are doing out there, those younger engineers will be drawn to the industry, right? Like, let's yeah, right. Greg, um, from a freeway perspective, what are you seeing um, obstacles? What are some obstacles out there that are preventing wireless from gaining more market share in the water industry? Sure. One of the obstacles that FreeWave encounters when trying to sell wireless solutions into the water wastewater industries um, is actually what David had mentioned there, that there is an aging workforce and, and sometimes um, those types of engineers might be reluctant to deploy a wireless solution. Um, people that have been in industry a long time, you know, people that are maybe in their 50s or 60s, a lot of those people are extremely uh, mechanically oriented in that they could take an engine apart and put it back together. They can fix anything under the sun with their hands. Um, but when you come to an invisible phenomena like wireless, something that you can't see. Um, people are less trusting of that. And it also is more difficult to address if there's problems, right? If there's a problem with a piece of cable, you can simply pull the piece of cable. You know, problems are, are very apparent and you can easily mechanically, you know, replace that cable. Um, when it comes to troubleshooting wireless systems, uh, sometimes that can be pretty complex. And, you know, as I mentioned, the, the complexity of that is you can't see uh, what you're working with. So probably a, um, a mistrust of wireless technology uh, is something that we frequently encounter. If I could jump in on, you know, one, one of Greg's points about, you know, maybe, maybe a little bit of an, an aging workforce. Um, you know, we've got a couple, uh, several wins recently um, in our Southwest region where we ran into exactly that um, a, as a challenge. Um, and, and, you know, I kind of alluded to the fact earlier, and this one was the customers are very reluctant to work, to, to move away from cereal. It's been around forever. It's super reliable. Um, and, and we've found a lot of success in, you know, finding out what the customer is kind of, I don't want to say afraid of, but what they're reluctant to move to a new technology and kind of address those concerns. Hey, this is a standard protocol that, that is, that is industry-wide. It, it's becoming very quickly an industry standard. Enhanced security, all those things, um, it, it, you know, working directly with a customer like that, if you can find out what their, 
reluctances are and, and, you know, build upon the strengths. We've had a lot of success doing that. Well, guys, thanks for joining us for the, another free wave tech talk series, uh, water and wastewater. Um, again, we're doing, um, five of these. We're focusing on a different industry. We'll have industry experts joining each one. Thanks for watching everybody. And with that, have a great day.